Ashes of Creation can be one of two things. The next big thing in MMORPGs, or the nail in the coffin for crowd-funded MMORPGs. If you've heard of Camelot Unchained... No, on second thoughts, let's not go to Camelot. It is a silly place. You may not be very excited at the prospect of what Ashes of Creation has been up to. Yes, I'm aware of Ashes of Creation Apocalypse, a Battle Royale-like game that they put out partially as a test, partially to perhaps raise some funds. Now, as a developer, I'm going to kind of side with Intrepid on this one. I know that that's not what backers are going to want to hear, but the idea of having some part of your game that's almost like a loop of your game with a modifier, the Battle Royale aspect, which I don't think is going to be a part of the actual Ashes of Creation, to put it out there, to have it possibly work and be very well tested so that you can see what works, what doesn't work with balances and game design there, if it worked, isn't a bad idea. The way it came out, the state it came out in, and of course, just the psychology behind it made it probably a bad call. But I can see some of what was hopefully the good intentions behind it, and I'm not entirely opposed. But let's put all of that aside and let's go back to the origin. To the Kickstarter that started it all back in 2017, they asked for 750,000, I think, something like that. And they got 3.27, 3.3 million. And I wanna break that down. Um, before we get into uh, the excitement that might come from that, from smashing your records and of all MMORPGs on Kickstarter, from making so much more money than you asked for, all of that good stuff, Let's just talk about finances for a moment. The burn rate of an MMORPG, I forget if it was Crowfall or if it was uh, Camelot Unchained, was over three million a year just for the staff. But let's just put it in Ashes of Creation's term. There's 13 project leads in Intrepid, okay? It's been six years. That's 78, so it's three million divided by 78. You get like 38.4K a year of salaries just for the leads, which there's no way that, you, that that a lead, well, I mean, there is a way, I suppose, if it was a passion project, but that's way beneath like half of what a project lead of these types, the creative leads would probably normally get in a, a project of this scope and magnitude. And that there's no health insurance factored into all that and all the other costs, the administrative costs and all of that. So that's how quickly the money can burn. but. They allegedly had enough money, enough funding externally, not including what they've raised here or in their backer packs to actually release uh, something playable. This is what is claimed. We're going to see that here. But before we get into that, I just want to talk about the concept. The game world should be player driven. In, in Star Wars galaxies, you had the capacity to build a city, um, you would start creating guilds and the guilds would vie against like who's going to be able to sell the armor to make sure that people die while wearing it because it put tremendous stress on the body. <laughs> and when you would go hunting in your armor, you would just like start backhanding crate dragons until you passed out from exhaustion. It was it was not a game that worked, but that concept behind how the world worked and creating structures and everything worked really well. That's what's exciting about Ashes of Creation. So let's get right into it. Here we are in their uh, Kickstarter page. We'll bring up their Kickstarter video. So this is Unreal 4, I believe, and um, you know, very pretty world, very nice volumetric lighting, um, nice lens flares. Particularly when the video came out, these graphics would have looked pretty impressive. Now, if you're looking at these graphics, we'll t take a pause here. If you're looking at these graphics as a cinematic, not very impressive, right? So th if you're looking at this as in-game graphics, which is what's being alluded to, what's being more or less promised here, pretty impressive. Bear in mind that later on, we're going to discover that you can have like 250 players in one place. Just bear that in mind. 
Hey guys, my name is Steven Sharif and I'm the creative director here at Intrepid Studios. We're working on an upcoming MMORPG named Ashes of Creation. And I'm pretty excited to share with you today on this Kickstarter what we're all about. Ashes of Creation is an open world, non-faction based MMORPG set in a high fantasy world. One of the Okay, so that, that's something that I, I definitely want to talk about. Um, non-faction based. And the fact that we're talking about a non-faction based is very important because if you have a faction based system, it's Horde versus Alliance. It's something that is going to make for uh, less interesting social situations. If you're completely cordoned off into red and blue team and you must just fight in the middle or for this keep or that, there's no there's no political intrigue in me just being on the red team and fighting blue team, no matter what. I'm not going to make an alliance. At least in, in Dark Age of Camelot, you had these, you know, when you're raiding keeps and stuff and there's three factions, you'd have this sort of time in which these two factions are kind of against the, the the faction that was winning. And and then maybe they they go this way and all of a sudden the, um, the pitch of the battle shifts. But the point being that it, it being factionless, although that sounds like it could be just chaotic and result in a bunch of griefing, even though they have anti-grief stuff, it's actually going to result in much more interesting social interaction. And that's that's absolutely key. The reasons that I started Intrepid Studios to create Ashes of Creation is because I myself am a gamer. I've been a gamer playing MMORPGs since I was seven years old. And, uh, you know, I've really never experienced a community quite like what MMORPGs have to Seven years old, okay? That, that beats me. My respect. Come on. My first uh, MMO-like experiences were Gemstone and uh, Dragon Realms, which were MUDs, which were like text-based uh, MMOs but I was probably around 12. To offer. It's, it's a diverse community. There's a lot of people involved, I mean, <clears throat> thousands of players from across the world. And, and it was just such a passion of mine to be able to experience that involvement in, in a game like an MMORPG. Over the past several years, having played MMORPGs, uh, I was kind of not impressed with what has been coming out of the genre. Um, a lot of pay to win, cash grab, style games and I just felt that there could be something better and so he's he's talking mostly about the 20 teens there which uh, you know honestly like almost all of the games that have come out re really of much import aside from what new world um, have been Asian you know Korean mostly um yeah, pay to win sort of models uh, or waifu sim simulators. <laughs> We've not seen the difference between a mud, EverQuest, World of Warcraft, insert game here, right? So we've seen, of course, there's Final Fantasy right now. There's uh, Black Desert. Um, you can even get into smaller games like, uh, you know, Albion and things like this. But none of these are delivering the next step. Right. We've had mobile. That's about it. Like mobile is a new thing. You guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys all have phones. Gonna... It's arguably not a good thing. And, uh, you know, if you want to get things done right, sometimes you just have to do them yourself. So in order to accomplish these goals for Ashes of Creation, I really needed to find a team that had. A... Uh, yes, sometimes you do have to do it yourself, but to do it on your own um, and and take that next step is going to be brutal. Even if you bring in a huge team, you've got to start with a big, big, big company to try to, to, to try to get to bootstrap from nothing. The next big thing is going to be very hard. However, there is another approach. The other, the other approach is that the next step is branching. It isn't something that is just clearly the, the next big thing. You've got, uh, you know, the next big thing for people who like PVP, who like economies, who like crafting, you know, start getting into niches that, that are better than their predecessors, but fulfill a niche. I don't think that that's what this game is attempting to do, but we'll see. A lot of experience with MMORPG production in the past, because as you know, an MMORPG is a massive project. Yeah. There's a lot of good talent here, and we were able to pull together a pretty amazing team. A team that's worked on Star Wars Galaxies, EverQuest 2, Call of Duty, and a lot of other titles. The reason we're here on... 
One of the worst aspects, I think, of the way that people do hiring and understand the concepts of from the maker of blank, right? If you're talking about we got the person responsible for the balancing of classes from this game that was really well balanced, that's something. If you get the animation director from a game that had beautiful animations, that's something. So you never know what you're getting when you hear these sort of things, like from the people who brought, who, you know, were in this project or that. It could be somebody who's fantastic, was the Atlas carrying the whole team on the back, or it could be the guy like me who basically came in and told Blizzard, like, hey, you guys should put the Diablo skill tree into your game. And they're like, no, really? <laughs> we hadn't thought of that. And, you know. Uh, absolutely deserve no credit for that. I'm not trying to say that I do. Kickstarter is because we want to expand the scope of our project. We want to make it bigger and better. We also want to give an opportunity to you to participate in that community development, to, to be in on our discussions of design. We feel that Kickstarter and crowdsourcing is a, is a pretty- I actually had a Kickstarter, which most people watching this would know, that went very long because we like these people may be doing, bit off more than we can chew. It took us seven years to develop Pop-Up Dungeon. And yes, we try to listen to a feedback as much as possible, but it, it is tough. And I can only imagine, this was in a, in a group of basically, as far as design is concerned, it was just me and my brother uh, arguing with one another if we're going to do this instead of that and prioritize this instead of that. You start bringing in a hundred other voices, uh, a thousand other voices. Um, it's very difficult to incorporate. So even though, honestly, I, I believe that their hearts are in it when they say something like that, because as a, as a designer, you want to hear what your audience has to say. It's extraordinarily difficult to do. It's, it's very difficult to manage what feedback is good, what feedback is not good. Good avenue towards that development. Ashes of Creation is, is really about four primary pillars. So this is the really important part. It's, it's about our node system, which is an integral part of exactly how the world works and, and interacts with you as the player. It's also about our meaningful conflict, uh, PVP, uh, and, and how you can catalyze change in the environment around you. Uh, the economy is our third pillar, which focuses on incentivizing you as the player to, to get out in the world and interact with it. Okay, so far so good. We've got the three pillars so far are the nodes, which we're gonna get into in just a second, but basically they're like evolving from camps to cities to castles, right? Um, based on the same way as just if I would gain experience, anything that's going to gain me experience, whether it be through crafting or things like this, it's feeding into the node if I've you know pledged allegiance to it or I'm doing it in the area of. Then in order to, of course, build on that, you've got the combat that is going to deal with the nodes. As one node gains sphere of influence over another, they might encroach on their lands. You're going to want to fight back, having a caravan go through the other land, all this sort of stuff. So that goes into the economy. Um, you obviously want to make sure that these people are rich in iron. These <laughs> people are rich in gold. These people are rich in whatever fanciful gems you want to make up. And they need to start trading. And if they're hostile to one another, then, and they don't want to trade, then you have to go and raid for these things. So those three pillars all work hand in hand. But now we're about to hear the fourth pillar. And last, but most important potentially is our, is our narrative. The, the but last and potentially most importantly is the narrative. Now I want you to think about what that means. Let's, let's let him explain a little bit more about it. The narrative really holds all of those systems together and, and keeping you as the player interested in exactly what different outcomes come about. When players first arrive... Just think about what that means, okay? So you have this tagline, like I think um, Albion online says this. It's, it's like, write your own story. Create your own story, right? Uh, it's a sandbox RPG. Come and tell your own tale. Uh, what does that mean? Does that mean jumping into like an arena, uh, grinding out loot? hitting a, a, a tree and a rock and and, and collecting uh, hides and stuff. Then I could say, uh, write your own tale. I'm creating uh, you know, just a first person shooter, Battle Royale. There's some silly stuff happens in a Battle Royale and it could be funny, but that's not really it, right? Let's be honest. Like when you're talking about write your own tale, 
in an MMORPG, what we want are systems that create stories, that create interest. As I just said, for instance, for the non-faction system, that creates politics and intrigue, which does lead to telling your own tale. The, the, nece the necessity of getting goods from point A to point B and having all these things that could occur along the way, like highwaymen and all this, and you're having to escort them. And if you don't get them there, maybe you're going to be in breach of contract of the treaty that you'd sign. These are stories. Now you can tell your own tale. But when you're adding narrative to it, I'm hoping, to, I'm hoping, and I don't know, I haven't looked into it enough yet, but <laughs> I'm not certain. I'm hoping it's like a rune stone somewhere, you know, like, you know, Stonehenge uh, in, in the world that just tells you, hey, the gods of this area are like this. Just a little history on, on the world and stuff. Not story-driven cinematic quests, because that's the antithesis of telling your own tale. And it is only going to get in the way. And it makes it so, so much more expensive and so much harder to develop that game. The game that has all of the sandbox elements with all of the player-driven stuff and your basically theme park based, you know, uh, MMO with just quest hubs and storylines. Let's hope it's not that. But now let's hear more about the system that very much interests me and most people, I think, which is the node system. There are tons of nodes throughout the world and each of them has a zone of influence. This zone of influence captures all the activity of the different players doing different things. It could be crafting, it could be fighting, it could be gathering. Anything that, that might give you experience is something that the node's going to be paying attention to. And as you level up your character, the node levels up with you. And as it levels, more and more civilization gets attracted to that area. Different nodes attract different events. A city that grows up on the side of a mountain um, might dig a little bit too deep and might disturb the things that are below. And that might include like a, a giant dragon that uh, erupts with a volcano and uh, lays down waste to that node that developed there. Um, and that's something that wouldn't happen any other place. That's, that's, a, that's an event that's unique to that particular node at that particular. Okay, so that there is, I think, the reason that this game did set the record for an MMORPG on Kickstarter. That's it. It's a super good and intriguing system, right? And the fact that the world is going to be developed literally by the player's actions, that these nodes are going to be unique, that these nodes are going to be like kingdoms, like cities, states, whatever it might be, and each of them driven by a group of players trying to develop it as one of four types. I don't know if it's mentioned in this video, but they have like science types and military types and faith and crafting or something like that. And each of them are run by mayors that are elected in a different way. Like for science, it's Democrat, uh, it's like democratically elected individuals, I mean, you know, popularity contest, you know, the military one, it's a, it's like a dual, you know, last man standing sort of thing. Um, that's really great. All of that's fantastic. Now, how is that going to relate to a story? I don't know. And how many nodes are there? Well, I think that they've mentioned that there's like 103 or 104 or something like that. That's an insane amount of nodes. If you want each node to be unique, that's an insane amount of nodes. And because of that, like players are going to experience this game very differently depending on, on how they build it. Each server is going to have its own story. And we're pretty excited to see what players do with that. How do they react to that dragon coming out that mountain? That's what differentiates our game from most others. It reacts to what the players do. It Again, beautiful. But 103 nodes? Classic error, right? So I think that uh, <laughs> Camelot Unchained had like something like 31 classes. This game has 64 classes. Now, granted, there it's like an eight by eight. So, so there's eight archetypes and you can sort of dual class. And uh, basically you create a grid of 64. This is, I think, the worst way that a... Now, I'm going to say small team. It's not a small team. It's a it's a sizable team, but a limited budget, limited scope kind of project. That's the last thing you want to do. The last thing you want to do is do 103 nodes. The last thing you want to do is 64 classes. Just have eight classes. Just just have um, 
12 nodes and have multiple servers. And then you can focus development on each of these nodes and on the eight classes, rather than having to work with how the eight types mix with one another to form 64 classes. This is the kind of worry that I think, uh, it, it's the problem with all of modern MMO uh, development. It's not just small teams, it's big teams too. If I'm gonna create World of Warcraft 2, how, how would I go about doing that? What would I have to do? Can, can I have less classes? Less races? Less uh, content? Less raids? Less battlegrounds? No, it seems like I have to do more. And that basically is impossible because MMORPGs are not like other games. They're not like other games in the sense that if I play a platformer, I'm done with the platformer, I'm ready for my next platformer. The next platformer doesn't have to be a far cry better or bigger than, than the one that I just finished playing. It just has to be more of the stuff I like. Uh, with a, uh, an MMORPG, I'm committed. I've, I have an investment in the MMORPG that I've already played. So I have to be presented with something unique, a novel reason as to why I would go to another game, not just simply more of the same. And so everyone gets stuck in this trap of saying, well, we got to do more. We got to go bigger. We got It's got to be huge. Because players are motivated by different things, because they want something from the game that other players don't want. Um, that's going to cause people to butt heads. Different players are going to want different experiences and the conflict between the two of them will create a, a bigger and better thing. So what drives you as a player in the game? For a lot of people, it's the economy, and that's why it's our third pillar. We, we really want the economy to incentivize you to interact with other players, to get out there and get resources to develop the world. We've regionalized our marketplaces. We've regionalized our warehouses. Uh, it's not just one global auction house, like a lot of games kind of throws the economy to the side. The global auction house isn't something that you're gonna find in our game at the early stages, or maybe ever. Rather, you're gonna to have to go to a town. You're gonna to have to buy, sell, or gather whatever you want. Mm -hmm. What this there creates is a competitive advantage, much mm -hmm. like we have in the real world. Some towns, some areas are gonna be better at certain things. Some are gonna be worse at some things. But the important part is that you get to play a role in who's better at what and who's worse at what. And if you wanna be better at something, we're giving you the opportunity to become better at whatever you want. So this is great because these are the things that are going to force people to interact, both positively and negatively. They're going to enter combat uh, with one another over resources of who controls a node. Uh, and yet it also forces sometimes cooperation because you can't be at war with everyone. You're going to have to be getting your resources to wage war from someone. Um, the caravans that, that they've shown, and I think they're about to talk about, let me see. As regional warehouses, we've incentivized the transit of goods. If you want to create local marketplaces or, or you want to create a local economy, you can do so because that mithril mine is nearby, um, you know, and yeah. it's not found somewhere else. The caravan system is what allows is. you to transit goods to other marketplaces. So that, that right there, chances are it's going to be like a battleground that's developing organically. And, and when you have a battleground situation, a 10 on 10, a 15 on 15, that's developing organically, it's the best. Because that's where your actions, the way you approach the combat is actually going to have major ramifications. If uh, two you know, factions meet each other in the middle of a battleground, an arena, uh, nobody cares. Like, uh, that's what they're doing. It's just a game. The end, right? Um, if these people are attacking this caravan, all of a sudden, like, there's a reason that you should call uh, your alliance members. There's a reason that you should tell uh, your perhaps neutral-ish kind of third party that, hey, look, this guy's being aggressive. These guys are being aggressive. If we don't start watching out for them, um, we're not going to be able to trade. Uh, and, and or the other guy says, hey, listen, um, you know, your your contract says you you want uh, 200 mithril bars or whatever. And uh, I'm just going to, you know, maybe give them to you for half price after I steal them or <laughs> whatever. And uh, just turn a blind eye when they come and say, uh, we need help guarding these, et cetera, et cetera. It just leads to very... Uh, organic and robust uh, social interaction 
that, that is actually telling a story. The economy is usually something that happens in the background of other games. And uh, from day one, we knew that the economy was going to be something really important. It's a huge motivating factor, huge. The fourth pillar in Ashes of Creation is our narrative, the story, and how it relates to you, both as an individual and as a member of the greater community. In Ashes of Creation, um, we've got uh, three main ways that we're going to be telling the story. One is tasks, one are events, and the final one is our overarching narrative. The narrative is going to be where you find most of the story. Each server will tell a different story, and this, is, this story is going to be told by the players. You're going to experience things differently when it comes to what bosses you've encountered because of how the world develops and how you have developed it. The node system is going to be what, what drives uh, what storyline branches players experience. Different NPCs are going to be attracted to different nodes. There's going to be different protagonists and antagonists based on how players build their world. It's all going to relate to the same basic story, but you're going to get different viewpoints on different servers, and you're going to find uh, different bad guys on different servers. It's all going to depend on what players uncover, how they uncover it, and when they uncover it. Different servers are going to be able to talk to each other. Okay, now that's that's a hot load of nothing and everything all at once. The word narrative um, is almost like a buzz term for just saying uh, story, right? If I said uh, our, our, the, the story is going to unfold in our story, it's going to be very storyful. And it's very important that story is a part of the story. Uh, it just, it sounds silly, but when I start adding the word narrative into it, um, it just becomes magical as though that, that encompasses more than just uh, text on a screen or, or, or mediocrely voice acted, uh, very um, stiff uh, NPCs going, uh, oh, you know, make sure that you kill 15 boars, not just 14, or none of this will be worthwhile. However, it might not mean that. Again, this is just very nebulous. It could mean that you're just literally going to spawn the dragon. So the dragon spawns if you had the big castle happen in the mountains. Otherwise, the dragon wouldn't spawn. It's a narrative. It's a narrative to say the dragon spawned and the players had to react to it and they did or they didn't. So the narrative unfolded differently because the castle crumbled. The dragon destroyed the castle because the, the they couldn't put the raid together or whatever. But that's the sort of thing that really worries me because if it's going to be an actual storytelling kind of theme park-like approach to an MMO, can you imagine this? 103 nodes, all with branching. We heard branching, which is, which is just literally poison to, to development. Uh, I, I tried to develop and I did. I mean, I did develop. I, I, I will also say that I tried. Um, because I don't know how successful I was. I tried to develop a very branching storyline in two of the quests in Pop-Up Dungeon. Um, one of them is Sweetwater, and the other one is the sort of Ring Runner campaign, the space campaign. And they took so long to do, and there's are still bugs in them, and their people <laughs> can't get to this node because they didn't have these it, it, it's it's a nightmare like the the amount of work that goes into making this decision branch here and then that another branch here it, it just keeps exponentially increasing work so if you're going to attempt to do anything meaningful because again it has to feel meaningful or there's no point like if i said uh oh you might spawn a guy who tells you to kill boars or a guy who spawns to tell you to kill wolves. Um, and depending on if you had killed wolves before or boars before, the different guy will spawn. Nobody cares about that. Just might as well not even do that. So to make it meaningful, it's a tremendous amount of work. You've just added so much work where you have already have the bones in place to let the narrative occur because of player interaction. So this is the thing that worries me most about the initial outlook of the game. Um, the interaction between narrative and branching narrative, heaven forbid, oof, and the world. <laughs> and, and, and figure out kind of 
you know, what they missed and fill in the blanks and, and be able to collaborate and build this bigger meta story that you won't That's get good. otherwise in other games. So with all of these four main pillars of design, you'll notice that it's really hard. For now that meta story is great. It's gonna happen naturally, no matter what. I don't know what it means that like servers can communicate. Of course they can communicate. I mean, there's the internet. How would you stop them from communicating? Maybe there's gonna be some integrated game, in-game things and in ways that they can communicate. But the point being that uh, this idea of having meta narrative, as in the way that even stuff that happens outside of the game obviously is going to affect people's opinions of people within the game. I mean, you're going to have, if, if this game were successful, let's say it was successful and it was going full, full steam ahead, you would have YouTube videos covering drama from mayors. You know, you'd have people who are just talking about like how this mayor made a, a naughty tweet and then he did, deleted it. But we've archived it, and here it is. And I don't know what we're going to do about this, boys. We're going to have to go down there and lay siege unless you oust the mayor. And this is this is like what happened to uh, Boris Johnson just recently, right? For us to talk about any one of them Sorry, Brits. without talking about all of the others. Um, and that's a or very for you? core part of our design. It's really important that all of these pieces fit together really well. Sure. And that they create an engine that allows people to keep experiencing new yes. things. But see, like, I can immediately tell you the way that the node system, um, that combat, and the, and, and the economy are going to interact I immediately. Like, that's, you know, they almost cannot not interact. But injecting narrative into it, that's the part where it just depends on what you're talking about. I think it'd be great to give people reason to say, hey, like the god of this place likes this, uh, you know, is, is this way and is is very much enemies with the god of that place. So, you know, maybe maybe we should be at war with them or or you know what? We're going to we're not going to go religious and we're going to eschew the gods and maybe the gods would get angry. And then now you have to fight the gods, but you're allied with the guys and the guys come help you to fight down the gods. You know, this kind of stuff would be awesome if, if you did it that way. If, if the story is just literally the um, conditions of the world. Right. Instead of an NPC with a little exclamation mark over his head and some text and some bores in your future. So I want to give you an opportunity here on our Kickstarter to of you get farm. involved in this project, to become a part of its development. Uh, we have enough self-funding to create a core viable product there in Ashes is. of Creation, but we really want to expand it. We want to make it bigger and better, and we know we can achieve that with your help. Everybody here at Intrepid Studios is incredibly excited about this project, and we're really hoping that we've infected you with that kind of excitement too. We want to get this thing done, and we want to include everybody to be a part of it. This is going to be a different game, and this is going to change the genre. So if you're as excited as we are, uh, let's do this thing. Let's, let's make this thing happen, because we can only do it with you. I've been on the other side of that screen. I've seen companies come to Kickstarter and, and promise the world, and either under-deliver or just don't deliver at all. But the reality is we're not those people. I brought together a team of industry veterans who've spent over 40 years combined working on MMORPGs and have created some pretty... Wait, 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 wait. 40 years combined? Uh, my, my team, my, my family has 36 years combined making games, right? So like 40 years combined making MMORPGs for a whole team. Maybe at this point it was a small team, to be fair. That's not a lot. That's, that's not, that is not a lot. The amazing titles. That's what we're gonna do here with Ashes of Creation. We're gonna create an amazing game. A game that you can be proud of. And you know, I don't wanna sound arrogant there, um, saying like, oh yeah, you know, we have 36 years. I would just say, I I'm still learning how to make games. Like, so um, after 36 combined years of experience, we're just flying by the seat of our pants. So I just wanted to make that clear. That's why I make that point. It's because not not because like 40 years isn't actually, you know, pretty impressive and all that. But um, MMORPGs are a lot harder to make than like a, a deck, uh, a, you know, roguelike deck builder. Um, they're a lot harder to make than 
for almost any game. It's like the highest difficulty challenge. <laughs> it's the maximum difficulty. Um, so 40 years combined experiences, uh, you know, hopefully going to be enough. Uh, but I don't know. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, you know, where they were at then. And I think that, uh, that that's definitely in, enough to get people excited there. If you believe the hype, if you bought into it and you thought, hey, all of this stuff is going to happen, it is going to happen because they already said they could do it. And now we give them 3.3 million. Forget like all the other, you know, projects that have been like this, like Star Citizen that has made <laughs> like a factor of 15 more than than this or God knows how much money they've raised now um, and they still haven't delivered a finished product. But I think that there's something good in this game. There's some there's a really, really good core idea. And as long as you stick to it narrowly and focused, you can make a good game even with a smaller budget here. Because what you're seeing here, all this sort of stuff, this is another stuff, this is another thing that I, I really wanted to say as a developer because I've seen people, you know, be ooed and awed by the graphics and stuff. Um, there's a lot of things that can look impressive, and you can have a team of five people using some store assets here and there and like making sure that you're cranking up the settings and um, using the latest HDRP pipelines for rendering. It's going to look great. It's going to look wonderful and um, it may even look fun. But the difference from going from there to the game actually works and is fun is insane. It's an insane amount of work. The difference between going from a demo to a finished product is crazy. But Blizzard did one thing that was, I think, the most brilliant aspect of World of Warcraft's design. They spent, I think they said like 90% of their initial design loop on just Goldshire, making sure that the game was fun to play, fun to go kill Hog or whatever it is. Um, that's how you do it. That's how you begin to make a fun game. And then once the bones are there, once it's just fun to play and it works and it doesn't break and all of this. Now you can spin out a new zone, a new raid, uh, add, add more spells and loot and stuff like this pretty quickly. MMOs have to be this way because they have to be derived from development tools. You have to develop the tools so that you can create the world, whether that be procedural stuff, whether it just be the way that you lay out the world, all that stuff, it has to be in the tools. It has to be in the back end. So, just because the game isn't playable yet, it hasn't reached like a persistent alpha, is not necessarily a bad sign. Um, the fact that uh, Apocalypse, which was that battle royale that they released, was very janky is not gr a great sign, but it's not necessarily like the end of it all. The things that worry me more are just the overreach, the 64 classes, the fact that, you know, you have, um, I think it was like Armor Smith blacksmith and weaponsmith are different professions. I get it because then that way you can find your niche and you're very important to your guild or that's a good thing. But it, anytime that you've got too many things that you have to develop as a developer and balance against one another and make sure that everything is fun and all the combinations are fun, you're making it nearly impossible for yourself. The bottom line is this, if they can focus the design, if they can focus on the things that are very, very much working in the game, which is the nodes, the development of the world, and the way that the world is going to actually generate conflict and reasons to cooperate. It's not just go out and do that. Like, yeah, go out and cooperate if you want. Go out and fight somebody if you want. There's reasons to do it. Uh, the world development forces it. It's like reality, right? That's how it works. If they can focus on that and keep everything else small and tight, I think that there is hope for Ashes of Creation. If they kind of try to please everyone, which is kind of the problem when you're bringing in thousands of people and thousands of voices, uh, you, you're trying to, to appeal to the person that wants the theme park, that wants the quest node, that wants the very story-driven uh, linear progression, it's, it's going to be impossible. I don't think it'll ever happen that uh, an MMO will come out, will be released, and actually please everyone. It, it's not... Maybe it's not even theoretically possible. Maybe, <laughs> but I, I wouldn't even begin to know how. And the last point that I want to hit on is something that I know is going to be a little bit controversial, but let, just bear with me here for a second. If I have ever run into one human being, one guy, 
who has said, uh, you know what? Uh, it doesn't sound so much fun like to, to have the Braveheart thing where there's like a hundred people and a hundred people and they're just like slamming together. That sounds boring, man. No, I, that, I don't care about that. I've never heard that. Everyone, everyone just intrinsically thinks, yeah, two armies just coming down from the hills and they're riding in and the cavalry and the sky turns black with arrows. Everybody loves that. That just, it immediately starts tickling something, right? Sieges with trebuchets and knocking over the parapets and fire and awesome. However, however, Anyone who's experienced this, I think, can understand what I'm about to say next. When I was a LARPer, and I'm outing myself as a as, as one of those guys that was like, fireball, 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 shoosh, you know, um, I always used to think, oh man, it sucks. I've only got like, it, at most we were like 12 on 12, 15 on 15, maybe. Um, uh, and most of the time we were just playing like, uh, you know, six versus eight, eight, you know. I always dreamt of the time in which we're going to be able to get all my kingdom together and run into battle with our banners and everything uh, charging with 40, 50 people against another army. And finally, it came that, you know, we had this big old meeting where everyone showed up and uh, like it was chaos beyond chaos. I had these uh, daggers that, that were made out of blue jeans and tape. So you just get like a blue jean leg, <laughs> roll it up, and then you put tape around it like really tight and hurl it. There was like this huge guy out there that was like a troll and he was going to, you know, had this huge axe that he'd made out of God knows what, you know, they're foam weapons. So there's not going to hurt you too much. But when there's that much heft to it, it's going to hurt a little bit if it hits you. So I was like freaked out a little bit about that, but I was like, all right, I got my daggers. I got my little throwing daggers. So I hurl that freaking I mean, it's like a football size thing. It was like a whole leg of a blue jean and, and a bunch of duct tape and, and electrical tape. Whoom, I just let that thing go. Flies perfectly, smashes the guy in the face. That doesn't count, by the way. When you hit somebody in the face, doesn't count. Smashes the guy in the face and he's actually knocked out. I'm disqualified. My daggers are thrown out. No more battles for me, right? Uh, on another occasion, I run into battle and it, again, it's just chaos. Was I hit? Was I not hit? These are the things where it's like, you know, you get hit in the arm and it's like, nah, I blocked that one. Um, uh, belt armor was a, a, a real popular one. Like you could have a little leather belt and, it, and you're, you'd get hit in the belt and you'd call belt armor. You know, I got one point armor. You got to hit me again. Um, but, uh, you know, you're running through there. You got hit like 50 times. Nobody's keeping track. You, I think I hit like 50 people too. Nobody died. It, it, it just becomes chaos. It breaks down. And in an MMORPG, it's just as bad. I remember um, there was uh, the Warhammer game that had these sieges and, and things like this. This is by the same people who ended up doing um, Camelot Unchained. It's the same people who did Dark Age of Camelot, which was a game I enjoyed. And the Warhammer game wasn't that bad. It just wasn't quite there compared to World of Warcraft. Again, there's no reason to play a second rate version of it of the thing. But they had these sieges. And what happened as, as my little goblin got into range of the skirmish, right? There's these two 40 person groups or you know, 20 some person groups. You get into range, you've got a paragraph of debuffs and you're going to die in like 10 milliseconds. Like you're, you're dead before your friends can start dispelling or anything because you just got hit by 20 players. Uh, if you played Alterac Valley, uh, if you played any of the large scale combat in World of Warcraft, it's the worst experience, except when you break it down into these little fights, when the little skirmish broke broke out, or like you're trying to fight over one tower in Alterac Valley. And yes, Blizzard tried to develop so that uh, you had reasons to break off like that, but you still had the Zerg just headed straight for the commander or whatever, the general just knock them out. This kind of thing doesn't play out like you think it would. Real war sucks. Real battle sucks. So uh, you want to have the experience of the skirmish, of the little uh, honor duel and, and, and with my friends. And now there's a few of us. And that's, the, that's where the fun is had in real life and in fake life in these games. So the idea of 250 people, if they could accomplish that fighting in one area at once, 
is not actually going to be fun. It might be a novelty for a little bit. It might make for some funny videos. And, and you know, there's always that fun, like Leroy Jenkins sort of moment where you're going to zerg the castle and all that. But uh, it isn't going to be fun gameplay. It's just not. And that's why what interests me is how the caravans work out, how fighting over like nodes of interest, like if you're capturing a mine or if you're trying to guard a mine or something. Um, these are the things that I think would lead to both the political intrigue and the fun combat. So that this is my more than two cents, maybe a, a, at least a nickel on, on uh, Ashes of Creation. But why it's uh, exciting to me, it's really the node system, the way it plays out for everyone. Tell me if you think that it's going to happen. Tell me what you think about um, Ashes of Creation. Am I completely off base here? Um, I know that it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. Some people are going to prefer, like I said, just a story driven thing, a single player experience, whatever. Um, I think there's going to be plenty of options for that. And there are. But this is what I think makes this particular game stand out. That's what the promise of this game is. And I think that there's a lot of players out there that would end up enjoying this maybe even more than they think that they would because maybe they haven't had an experience like it. I've had a few experiences sort of like it in, in games that make me believe that this is going to be major if it could work. But is it possible? Is it possible? How much would it cost? Are they on the right track? Is Apocalypse, the Battle Royale's failure, uh, sort of a, 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 a big strike or is it just a minor speed bump? Uh, let me know what you think and please comment, like, subscribe.